Hi everyone, this is Peter Beal, uh, just following up uh, on the second part of a short discussion on the relationship between art history and modern art. And by modern art, I'm uh, referring, as I mentioned in the previous talk, I'm talking about art that's going to date from about the middle of the 19th century up into, um, depending on how you define modern, um, maybe later in the 20th century, uh, more sort of colloquial Everyday usage simply means contemporary art. We're going to spend some time distinguishing the different phases of uh, modern art, particularly talk about modernism, postmodernism, and um, you know, trying to break down the differences between all of those different um, different move, art movements and the ideas behind them. Uh, anyway, the last time uh, I was talking uh, about art, I was um, talking a little bit about um, talking a little bit about Edward Manet's um, Bar the Folie Bergère. So that's where um, I left off uh, discussing the ways in which Edward Manet, who's a really formative uh, figure in the development of this new direction in art, takes apart our expectations of visuality and its representation. Now that sounds a little bit uh, jargony. So let me just break that down a little bit for you. By visuality, I'm simply going to talk about um, basically the ways in which we see, uh, the assumptions that are built into seeing, um, and then by representation, I mean uh, the manner in which uh, people, artists, uh, try to represent those ways of seeing and those assumptions. The key uh, point I was trying to make in the previous talk uh, about visuality and representation is the very focused effort, uh, particularly uh, after about, I don't know, 1860, 1870, effort on the part of artists to really look at seeing, look at representation, reflect on it, and begin to take it apart. Um, I suggested that in the, um, in the Manet piece, we're looking at, for instance, a window uh, into uh, space that is actually a um, that's actually a mirror. Now mirrors have been used in art before, and so that's not particularly uh, innovative or um, you know a departure from tradition in art history. But I think the important thing here uh, in Manet's rendering of the mirror is to basically block out any of the traditional frames. There's only a hint of them, for instance, a frame down here. And of course, the allusion to art and art frames uh, can't be missed by anybody thinking about this. Um, frames or separations or a kind of insistence on the mirror being a physical object that, you know, that has this optic quality. Instead, the mirror really, be, really takes over the entire background uh, of the piece and makes it um, you know, simultaneously an extension of space and also a barrier to space. I talked a little bit about the way in which um, Manet, in a kind of political economic commentary, um, transforms the traditional still life. And you can see the, the glass bowl of oranges and the various bottles of champagne and beer and, and this kind of thing, the flowers. And makes it a comment really on a marketplace of buying and selling. I mentioned last time, for instance, the whole notion of buying, uh, in a sense, means accepting the terms of the artist and what the artist is trying to say. But I think that Manet puts his hand, as it were, in the way of that easy uh, transaction. Uh, underlying uh, all of this is the idea that, you know, the, the idea of the artist and the artwork for sale and the subjects of the artwork for sale, that's implied in here, in a radically transformed uh, European social scene. Um, the idea of seeing is, again, confounded even more, of course, by the spectators that are reflected in the background. And they're, of course, staring at something that we can only catch the barest hint of in, in the upper left corner. So you have this strange mixture of different gazes, different modes of seeing, and different ways in which we're, you know, prevented really from going any deeper uh, into um, into what's actually going on. 
there's, you know, again, a hint of this. I suggested this in the expression of the young lady uh, behind the counter. Um, are we given any access into her inner state, uh, her emotions, her thoughts, her feelings? Um, we're certainly prevented uh, from further insight into any of the other figures, the the top hat a gentleman in the upper right. Is he, you know, what's he really up to? What's he asking for? This, the spectators in the back were, were simply, they've been reduced to, to blobs of paint. So at every turn, Manet offers a kind of tantalizing glimpse into a different world of, of uh, really a different world of art, but I think quite masterfully prevents us from going, uh, from making any deeper assumptions uh, uh, about how that's going to work or how we're going to, um, how we're going to make sense of any of this. One of the accusations that's lodged against the likes of Manet, and, and Manet is a very sophisticated uh, artist, um, but that he refused to follow this sort of academic uh, line of painting. And, and academic art, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this as we go through the, you know, the, the beginnings of this story of modern art. Academic art emphasizes the kinds of things I talked about with Masaccio, clarity of form, structure, balance, moral themes, um, a focus on getting it right in the sense of uh, representations of human beings in action and, and that kind of thing. Um, the likes of Manet and, and Claude Monet, we talked a little bit about that with the Impression Sunrise, are pushing uh, back against the notion that a painting needs to be very highly finished, technically expert, um, the result of lots and lots of of uh, study and concentration and, of course, education in an academy. We begin to see, as we move through the 19th century, a lot of emphasis on art that is outside that training system and that subscribes to different values. A great example, uh, which has proven to be remarkably, uh, the appeal of it has proven to be very durable, is the work of Henri Rousseau who worked as a customs inspector, uh, hence he had the nickname Le Douanier, the customs inspector, literally in French, um, who basically had no real formal education in the academic sense and no real affiliation with the um, new wave of the uh, avant-garde, as it were, uh, that's beginning to emerge in the 19th century. Avant-garde simply means art. It's on the, you know, the leading edge of change. Um, he, produced a number of very evocative and haunting uh, uh, canvases. This is a good example of one, The Sleeping G Gypsy, that speaks toward an inner dreamlike state and really confounds any attempt to um, place it within the standard repertoire of subject matter or um, you know, location and time or space or anything like that, um, and presents us with a, a kind of inner dream, an inner a consciousness or even subconsciousness uh, that isn't quite like anything we've seen before. There have been paintings of lions and there have been paintings of so-called gypsies, but this alliance of a uh, barren uh, remote landscape, a sleeping, um, you know, quote unquote, exotic figure in this desert, and of course, this lion checking out what this is all about. This is, this is unreal and indeed the term surreal uh, probably uh, could be applied to this, although it's a little bit before the actual time of surrealism. So the probing of inner states of consciousness or semi-consciousness or subconsciousness is going to be a big uh, part of uh, the changes in, in, uh, in art at the, at the turn of the 19th century. Um, another uh, important turn that happens in the beginning of the 20th century is a drive toward abstraction, that is to say, discarding entirely uh, conventions of modeling, representations of three-dimensionality, um, conventional color, so-called local color, you know, leaves on trees are green or the sky is blue, that type of thing, um, and inclination to uh, really abandon uh, classical norms of human representation. Um, all of these are, are kind of brought to the fore in Pablo Picasso's memorable piece, Le Demoiselle d'Avignon of 1907. And in this, 
uh, Picasso has incorporated all the phenomena I've just mentioned, along with an uh, interest in modes of representation of a non-Western variety, in particular uh, African masks, so-called primitive art. Um, Picasso is certainly defying the standards of conventional beauty, at least in, in art at the time. And it's important to understand that uh, Picasso from a very early age was very skilled in conventional modes of representation. So he's painting very believable um, uh, scenes at a very early age, like, like as a young teenager. Um, in Les uh, <coughs> Demoiselles, he uh, really explodes all of that. And this is uh, reducing the, the picture away from a window into a kind of collection of scattered fragments and planes. And the tradition of the academic nude is uh, definitely undermined and, 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 and taken apart. Um, abstraction can be taken to a kind of non-representational level, and we're going to start seeing that uh, as an important part of the repertoire of uh, 20th century artists. And a good example is the Russian Vasily Kandinsky, where he takes uh, art, uh, his art to a, a new level of distance from uh, any subject matter that we might recognize. One's tempted to say, well, you know, in this improvisation that we might be looking at a landscape or perhaps, you know, some other recognizable subject, but we're never allowed a full kind of uh, access to that uh, representation. It's really, um, upon closer inspection, a, a collection of linear uh, motifs and patches of color, and there's really no uh, attempt on the artist to really clarify any of that. Um, and we might say, and this is a, again going to be a classic critique of modern art, that this represents a lack of skill and inability to do the kind of academic art uh, that would have seen quote-unquote official approval at the time. Um, this is probably not going to make a whole lot of sense, especially if we consider, for instance, as a as a, a corollary, the developments in music uh, at the time. And of course, music is not an art form that depends upon representation of subject matter. Uh, we can simply be moved by or interested by or find evocative musical notes that are really just mathematical constructions. So why can't color and form behave the same way? What can we do with these, um, you know, these ways of making art? So Kandinsky and many others are certainly moving in that direction. I mentioned surrealism with uh, Henri Rousseau. Um, someone like, and again, extraordinarily technically accomplished painter, Salvador Dali, is going to take the, um, the dream world to a new level of remoteness and distance. And that's certainly going to be a theme, whether it's Dada art following the First World War, really all the way through to the present. The sense of artistic um, creation working in or moving toward worlds completely unlike our own or just a little bit like but a whole lot unlike as a kind of commentary on the mystery or even just downright absurdity of modern uh, life. is It's going to be a, a pretty common theme, I think. Surrealism had a huge influence uh, on uh, art, extending way past its sort of heyday in the in the uh, sort of 20s through maybe, you know, the 50s or thereabouts. And certainly Salvador Dali remains one of the most popular uh, artists of the 20th century. Um, Jackson Pollock uh, takes the, the idea of abstraction to a kind of new uh, level and, and provides a kind of sense of insight into where we could, where we could go next. Which so is to say, when Kandinsky was improvising, um, it still has a sense of of uh, making kind of you start a line and finish a line and put and and you know put a patch of blue down. In the case of Pollock, and we'll definitely develop this more, we're going to see an emphasis on the kind of an echo of music of the artist's own inner consciousness sort of being brought to the fore, really through gesture and through uh, pure expression through movement. And this is something that really defies, in many ways, all of the tradition of Western art, art up until that time. And uh, it's a good sort of jumping off point for considering what happens after this 
uh, this artist's career.